welcome to one more broadcast of the Life for All Institute. The general subject, the Gospel of John, Word, Life, and Edification. Now we got to message number 21. The title is, Jesus is Arrested and Unjustly Tried. Scripture reading is the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verses 1 through 40. Today's message, it is regarding uh, the whole chapter 18, and it speaks about a sorrowful chapter in the history of Jesus being arrested and tried unjustly. It is important that this is recorded in the Bible to have the awareness and understanding how it all happened. But before we enter in chapter 18, I still would like to point out some important points in the previous chapters of John. We saw that God he called us into his kingdom and glory. We are predestined already to the glory of God. But how can God, God can glorify man? How is he able to lead us to his glory if his glory it is only for the uh, most intimate ones who enjoy God's glory. So, there's a whole process of work. This process of work begins with the Word. The Word needs to be the Word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It is not just an ordinary and random word. That is why in John chapter 17, let me get your attention here to verse 7 and also to verse 8. Now, they have known, they whom, they, the ones whom the Father gave to the Son and trusted him to care for them, and he will carry them to the end. So, Jesus said, Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you, for I have given them to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Dear brothers and sisters, here we see a marvelous principle that it is quite important that the sent one of God, his strength and his authority, it is in the word that proceeds from the one who sent him. In other words, if the sent one speaks his own words, if he does his own work and he acts according to his own will, he will not have the strength of God, he will not have the power of God to fulfill any work. That is why, brothers and sisters, this is a very important point, and I want to highlight this. I want to make sure to highlight this. The sent one of God, he does not speak his own words. He does not present his own things proceeding from himself. Anything that proceeds from men, dear brothers and sisters, cannot fulfill the work of God. That is why Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that 
we are not capable of thinking of something from ourselves that is nothing from the work of God. We're not sufficient of ourselves to think of anything that is the, it doesn't proceed from man, it proceeds from God. So then the work is accomplished. Dear brothers and sisters, this works in our day-to-day -day circumstance. When we, we use the word of the Lord and we fulfill it, for example, the preaching of the gospel on the streets, we bring people and have them to pray and we pray with the words the Lord gave us. This word comes out with power and it works. But if the word from the immersion here, the paper in the immersion, works on the street with some people who we do not know, does that word also works in your family relationship, in your relationship with the saints, with people? That is why, brothers and sisters, let us always use this more. So whenever we receive something that proceeds from God, the Word of God, we saints, we have an authority to enjoy the power in this Word. So this is very, very important. Remember, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4, Jesus said to the tempter, the man shall not live on bread by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So remember this, brothers and sisters. Do not think that you, day after day, worry about your work, your livelihood, to have a guarantee for the future, economic guarantee for the future. And say, I have no time for other things because my work is taking up all my time. But you have to be aware that men shall not live by bread alone. He's only concerned about, if man is concerned only with bread, he will have with lots of shortcomings in his emotion and also in his spiritual life. So we cannot live by bread alone. Brothers and sisters, we need to seek the word of the Lord. But it's not merely a theological word from a doctrinal teaching. But brothers and sisters, we need the word that proceeds, that comes out of the mouth of God. That is why, brothers and sisters, this word here in Matthew 4.4 4 in Greek, it is rima. It is the instantaneous word. It is the word that God wants to supply you at that very moment. That's it, brothers and sisters. That's why the immersion sheet works, because it is the word of the moment. And God supplies you with this word, and you can live out it. Live out this word. This word gives you power. This word gives you life. It gives you the love of God. And you are supplied. Your soul is supplied, and your spirit is supplied to live. That is why, brothers and sisters, this is a very important point. And second point that I'd like to cover before going to John chapter 18, brothers and sisters, it is to show you that all the work that God is doing, it is to lead us to the glory of God. How can God lead us to the glory of God? This is a process of a work that I showed you in Colossians 1. There we see that the, uh, the glory not only has a power, a power of God, but the glory has also a strength. The strength of glory does what? Fulfills a work in us. What is the work that the glory of God fulfills in us? It's not merely something of a decoration. It's not something of a bright a splendor, but the glory as a strength. The glory works in which sense? It works in a sense of bringing man into this glory, into his own glory. But how this glory does that? So here we read that God, Jesus, left a word in John chapter 17, in verse 17. Sanctify them by your truth. 
your word is truth. So the first thing that the, the strength of glory wants to lead us into the glory of God needs to work is to sanctify us. How can this glory to bring something that is not holy within holiness itself? There's, there's no way. So God needs to sanctify us, right? So what is the way to sanctify us? It is through His Word. It is through the truth. So God, let us read Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. There we read, Christ loved the church. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church, gave himself for her, that he might, Christ gave himself for us, gave himself for his church, but he has a goal. He wants to bring us into his glory, but before bringing us into his glory, he needs to sanctify us, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That is why, brothers and sisters, God needs to wash us with the water of the word. This is the reason why we are promoting and encouraging you all, each and every day, to have contact with the word the Lord is giving us every week. This word, it's not merely for us to get it from no, biblical knowledge from this word, theology. No, this Bible, this word, brothers and sisters, it is to wash us, to cleanse us, and to sanctify us. So that is why, brothers and sisters, you, you cannot just memorize it and have a biblical knowledge through this word every week. You need to inculcate it in your heart. You need to repeat. You need to go over it over and over again. That's what the, the teenagers are doing. Immersing themselves in the Word. You immerse yourself in the Word. You repeat the Word. If you're alone, you repeat by yourself. If you have somebody else, you repeat with him or her. You know, by immersing in the Word, that you will see that this Word, little by little, will be inculcated in your heart. And this Word, you, you may not even realize it, but this Word will be inculcating the very truth inside of you. God is the only true God. He alone is the true one all in this whole universe. If you get out of the true God, you are connected to the lie, to falsehood, to vanity. That is why only God is the true God. And God, the true God, he sends Christ as the truth through the word. Christ comes to you as the truth. What is that? God is filling you with the very reality. And this same word which brings the reality of God, it is cleansing you from the things that are not the truth. He is removing from you all of the elements of falsehood, of vanity in your thoughts, of the natural life still in the old man and the old creation. Brothers and sisters, this word is cleansing us. Even from our soul life, our own will, Christ, through his word, is cleansing us, washing us, as in our bloodstream in your body, on the one hand, is supplying you with nutrients to each cell of your body, but also at the same time it is removing toxins from each of your cells, throwing them away. This is the process of the washing of water by the Word on which sanctify us. It is filling us with the very nature of God, the holy nature of God, which is the very truth. So, brothers and sisters, through sanctification, we are then filled with the truth. Brothers and sisters, you may check. 
do not despise our young ones, our teens, who are immersing themselves in the Word faithfully every day. They love the Word of God. They transcribe the Word of God. They learn to sleep with God, hearing messages. They wake up with God, hearing messages. At all times, they're inculcating the Word, even in school. They are doing well in school. Why, brothers and sisters? Because the Word is opening their understanding. I don't know if you realize, if you had a conversation with them, who is, uh, is of a young age, but you can realize they have consistency. They have cons spiritual consistency. The Word is not just passing by them, passing by them, by, passing by their lives in an empty way. It's been deposited in them. If you have a hold a conversation with them, anything about the prophetic word is already being shared. They are constituted with this truth. That is why, brothers and sisters, it is worth it for us to follow this example and to live in this way. And we will be filled with the truth. And being filled with the truth, brothers and sisters, what happens? This very word comes with God's holy life, it comes with God's holy nature, it comes with the very truth, with just Christ filling us, but also one thing that we cannot forget, but this insisted this word brings God's nature, which is love. The love of God, dear brothers and sisters, the love of God has a binding, binding effect as an effect of connecting, of binding, of bringing together the love of God, brothers and sisters, connect us with God. The love of God connect us with one another. It joins us together perfectly and builds us together. Brothers and sisters, this is what God is doing. So when we are for the Word of God, sanctifying us with the truth, we are brought into more and more within the glory of God, within God Himself. We have been brought into, brothers and sisters, in the very oneness of God. We already said, brothers and sisters, in Proverbs chapter 8, that before God created this world, before creation, God was alone in this universe. There was only Him, but He was not lonely as we used to think. The Father and the Son, the child and God, the Father and the Son, they were very well settled. You know, they, they lived in a perfect relationship, in a relationship of love, the love of God. One was the joy of the other. One was the pleasure of the other. They lived in such a happiness that they had this Organic one as the fathers and the son, the sons and the father. Humanly speaking, in our logics, we cannot understand that, but that's the way it is that the father and the son were living in eternity. But one day, the father proposed in calling man to invite men to be part of this oneness, to be part of this glory, to be part of this joy, of this happiness in which God, the trine God, was living. But saints, look, what a privilege. Among so many creatures, he chose man. He created man after his image and likeness, and he is preparing us, brothers and sisters, to glory. What is to prepare us to glory, brothers and sisters? He's preparing us to invite us to be part of this organic unity and to be part of the glory of God. If you do not believe my word, so let us see John 17 in verse 1. Father, as you are in me, and you are, and I am in the Father, so this is an organic union. Physically, it is impossible the Father to be in the Son, and the Son in the Father. Two bodies cannot be the same space at the same time. This is physics. But God is spirit. So brothers and sisters, this one is of the Father and the Son, the Son and the Father. And God is calling us to this mysterious oneness and organic oneness. Here we read also for them to be in us. To also participate. For man to participate in this organic union. So that the world believe 
that you sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me. You see, this glory does the work that they may be one as you, we are. So the strength of glory works to be one in the organic union of God. I in them. Where am I? To be one as we are. I in them and they in me so that they are perfected in oneness. So the glory does this work for this oneness. And that the world uh, know that you love me, then they love me. So you see the element of love. Love is the only element capable of bringing this organic and perfect oneness. This is the love of God, but it's just, it's, praise God, the Lord is bringing us into this glory, into this oneness. It's not a superficial oneness that men have, you know, as friendship or as being close to one another with the same taste. This is not this kind of oneness. This is a very weak, fragile, limited oneness, but God wants to bring us into a perfect oneness, an organic oneness. And who does this work? It is the glory, and we will be brought into the, this very glory. And we will be with God, joined together forever. Are you happy with that? I am really happy. But on the other hand, before I get to chapter 18, I'd like to add, brothers and sisters, this is not something just for the future. This glory, it is not something just for the future. And that day, we'll be enjoying this glory. No. Today, even today, we are already experiencing this glory. I read to you uh, with in the broadcast with Pac that when Moses, he had fellowship with God. He had this close relationship with God. You can also have this close relationship with God through his word. By immersing yourself in the Word, you will be able to get to know God. You have to have a close relationship with God. So Moses entered in, the, in this tent. He had uh, fellowship with God, and f he spoke with God while well, God spoke with, with him. And what happened? He was filled with the glory of God. He was filled with the glory of God. That is, his face was shine with the glory of God in the tent of meeting. So after he received the instruction of God, a commandment from God, word from God, he went out to the people and he passed on the same word to the people. But when he went out, his face was shining. Why was his face shining? He was filled with the glory. Because he was speaking with God, contacting with God, with the Word of God. It, you can have this experience as well. When you have contact with God, contact with the Word of God, you immerse in the Word, your face shines. Not physically. But people realize that you are different. Okay? And still, when Moses came out to speak to the people, what gave him authority for the people to hear him as the word of God? It was this glory on his face. So much so that when the glory over time was fading away. Today the glory is no longer fading away. But at that time the glory was fading. Then when it fades he loses the authority in his word. Because the glory gave him authority to speak for God. You understand? So when he lost glory, he rushed back into the tent of meeting and he continued in the presence of God. And he was again supplied with glory. But in the New Testament, brothers and sisters, we have no more need of that. This glory, it is like, is cumulative. Second Corinthians 3, let us read it. Lord Jesus. Isn't that wonderful, brothers and sisters? Verse 
verse 13. Like Moses who put a veil over his face so the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of that what was passing away, but their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Brothers and sisters, why Moses put a veil on his face when glory was passing away? Because Moses didn't want to the people to see this glory fading so he he came back to be recharged with glory in God's presence now brothers and sisters in verse 17 now the Lord is a spirit when the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty where the spirit of the Lord is brothers and sisters where the presence of the Lord is where the Lord word of the Lord is where the glory of the Lord is verse 18 this is our experience today but we all with unveiled face beholding as in the mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as the, by the Spirit of the Lord that is why brothers and sisters when we preach the gospel we go co-porting when we contact people brothers and sisters when we immerse ourselves in the Word, the immersion in the Word brings us glory. This glory gives us authority to speak for God. And people then realize, they receive it, the power of God. And miracles happen on the streets. Praise the Lord. Today, I have no more need to wait on that day to experience glory. Today, we already experience glory. This glory, it is cumulative. It doesn't pass away. It doesn't fade away. It, it accumulates one over the other until we are fully transformed. Amen. Okay, th this is good, right? Now let us get to chapter 18. Lord Jesus. Now in chapter 18, in verse 1, here is in Gethsemane, which is a garden. He was betrayed. He was arrested in this garden. I don't know. You know how geographically the way it is like you know I said to you many times I visited the place at the Mount of Olives let us say that I'm here on the Mount of Olives and before the in front of the Mount of Olives there is a brook called Brook Kidron and on the other side of the of the uh, the valley there is uh, a, a land, a piece of land there, the where the, the 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 temple was, the plateau of the temple after the Vel of Kidron, it is the Garden of Olives. And speaking from from where I am here, that would be to the east of the temple. Okay, the Kidron Valley goes from north to south, so here it is on the on the east, and when Jesus gets, uh, Jesus comes, returns. When Jesus returns in the nations, the armies of the nations would try to corner the people of Israel to do away with them. Jesus will come back, who will tread with his feet, his right foot, on the north side of the, the mountain and the south. The Mount of Olives will be split in two. And the people of Israel who would be cornered, they would have a escape route to flee to the east. You understand? So at the Mount of Olives, 
down below here, close to the Kidron Valley, at the foothill is the Garden of Gethsemane. In the Garden of Gethsemane. So just so you understand geographically. In John chapter 13, what happened? In verse 21, Jesus indicates the traitor in his supper. Do you remember? John chapter 13, when Jesus had said the things, he said, So, now before the feast of the Passover, when Je verse 1, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, as the supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Jesus Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So here it is the betrayal. And verse 30, 30, verse 29, for some thought because Jesus had the money box, and then in verse 30, having received the piece of bread, then he went out immediately and it was night. So do you remember, just for you to be located in time, that was the supper. Right? Jesus was there with them with the feast of the Passover with his disciples. He indicated the traitor. The traitor left from the, the supper. Okay? And Judas left. The, only the eleven remained with Jesus. And Jesus from chapter 14, he opens up his heart, right? All the way to chapter 17, he spoke of the deep things of his uh, feelings, his intimate feelings. And then this is the moment that he was at the supper. And Judas, when he left, he went to contact the main priests, right? He would bring soldiers where Jesus was. So he knew that Jesus was in the supper, the place where they were having the supper. So Jesus, after he spoke with his disciples, he said, let us get out of this place. Because he knew that the, the one who was betraying him would bring soldiers, the detachments of troops there. So Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, just so you understand it. And Judas went there, he must have gone to the place of the supper, did not find Jesus. He knew that Jesus from time to time, he took his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane, so he went there to see, to see him. So in the end of chapter 14, already said, in verse 31, Sorry, Lord Jesus, it's actually a 1331, uh, when he left, Jesus said, uh, now the traitor has left, and uh, now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. So when he had gone out, Jesus said that. And Jesus said, let us leave this place. So, Jesus left with his disciples to the another side of the... In chapter 18, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Jesus was in Jerusalem. He was close to the temple. He left from there. He went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron. He went to the Mount of Olives, the Garden of Gethsemane. Verse 2 and 3. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place. He did not find Jesus at the, uh, the, the supper, and then he went also to that place, because Jesus there, 
For Jesus often met there with his disciples, but then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Oh, Lord Jesus. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he, and Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. I am he. When Jesus said, I am he, Jesus said the name of God. I am. So, whom are you seeking? Jesus said, I am. He who is from eternity to eternity. I am who he was, is, and who is to come. He is the I am, the very existence. That is why the soldiers they drew back and fell to the ground. Because he pronounced the name of God. Then, when Jesus said, when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. And then he asked them again, whom are you seeking? And Jesus said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. Look, Jesus is concerned. Jesus knew that when he's arrested, the intention of the main priest was to arrest them all, of his disciples. So Jesus said, if you are seeking me, okay, so you just let these go their way. Do not arrest them. So Jesus actually said the name of God he revealed to Moses in Exodus 3.14. I will not read it again. And then John 8.58. That is why the soldiers drew back and fell to the ground. Even suffering the betrayal of Judas and the soldiers' intimidation, Jesus still was concerned with his disciples. Verses 10 and 11. And Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Actually, I am here voluntarily. Because if I do not want to, nobody would harass me. Nobody would take my life, right? So I'm here because I want to do the, 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 fa the, the Father's will, to drink of his cup. Jesus made it clear. Let us see. In John 10, 17 and 18. Let us read it. Therefore, my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. I lay down my life. No one takes out, take it again. I, I lay, da lay down, in verse 18, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. My Father gave me this authority over my life. I lay it down vo voluntarily. If I don't want, no one will take it from me. Do you understand? So even with this, all this violence, this military apparatus to arrest Jesus, if Jesus did not want to, they would not take him. Just to understand it. Lord Jesus. So Luke recorded in Luke 22:51 that Jesus healed Malchus. 
Let us read it quickly just for the record. Luke 22, 51. Uh, then Jesus healed him. So Jesus uh, healed the man who had his his uh, his his ear cut off. Let us read now in Matthew 26:47, the same record of Jesus being arrested. Matthew chapter 26, verse 47. While he was still speaking, behold, Jesus, one of the twelve, with a great multitude, with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Look, the, he's coming to arrest a robber, but Jesus is not a robber. He came in to, with swords and clubs. Who sent him? Who sent them? Coming from the main priests, the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him. Look how ugly this is. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and, and kissed him. This is ugly, right? Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? And they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. We know that he was, this was Peter, and Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father, who will provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? How do you think, how then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? Lord Jesus, brothers and sisters, do you know that, uh, what is the number for 12 legions of angels? One legion of the soldiers, the Roman soldiers, was a the vision of the Roman army compo comprised of more than 6,000 men. So multiply 6,000 for 12. How much that is? 70, 72,000 angels. 72,000 angels. Saints, he only needs to send to the Father. Father, send the angels here to help me. So 72,000 angels. Did you know God created many angels. We have millions and millions of angels. Did you know that? Huh? Did you know that? That is why, brothers and sisters, even if a third of the angels followed Satan, there are two thirds of the angels, brothers and sisters, who are serving God. Did you know that many things do not happen to you because the angels protect you? Because God has his angels who are camping around us. That is why teens, do not be afraid. Okay? God has millions, millions and millions of angels. Many angels serving God serving those who will inherit salvation, which we see in Hebrews chapter 1. So we are cared for by God, also through the angels. 
who then God could send 72,000 angels, but how would be fulfill the scriptures? Jesus had to die. So Jesus said to the multitudes in verse 55, Matthew 26, 55, that hour Jesus said to the multitudes, have you come out as again as a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple and you did not, did not seize me while I was there speaking with you. You did not have the courage. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Brothers and sisters, this is important for us to know. All the disciples forsook him. Peter said, oh, even that everyone abandoned you, I'll never abandon you. Even that I have to give my life, I will give my life to you. But he also fled. He, he just took off. Lord Jesus. Let me explain to you the setting, the environment at that time. In Matthew 11, 26, in the footnote of King James Updated, there's a footnote explaining that all the Roman soldiers added up with the uh, armed police officers that were the order of the Sanhedrin, the court of the Jews, added up together, there would be around 500. If you add up all the armed police officers of the Sanhedrin and the, the servants, the police officers were to keep public order, to maintain public order, and the Roman soldiers are from the army. So if we add them all add all them up, that would be 500 people. Imagine in a garden, apparently a small place, all of a sudden 500 people show up with uh, torches, lanterns, swords, and clubs. Imagine the, the terrifying environment at that, that time. They stay in a Roman court from the fortress of Antonia. The fortress of Antonia Fortress of Antonia are from the in the case of was Pilot, when the governor is not in the service in Jerusalem, he just go to Jerusalem because of the, the Jewish feasts. If there was a need to speak with the leading one of the Jews, so then at the time of the feast, he would live there and be in the service in the fortress of Antonia, Antonia's fortress in Jerusalem. The rest of the days he would remain in another place called Caesarea. Uh, Caesarea, do you remember that was, was by the lake of Genesareth, and that was called the Sea of Galilee, and also because of Caesarea was named after also to the lake. So since these were two places where the Roman governor stayed, since they knew that there was a need for judgment, for trial, and also because of the, the Passover feast, so the Roman govern, governor was in Antonia Fortress. And when the governor came, a big detachment of a military of officers came with him. Just so you understand it. So let us continue. In John chapter 18, 
verse 12. Then the detachment of troops and captain and the officers of Jesus arrested Jesus and bound him and led them him away to an ass first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. So, saints, here it begins the the judgment of Jesus. Jesus then would be judged by the authorities of the Jews by the law of Moses. So in the grounds of the law of Moses, the Jews then judged Jesus from that moment. So do remember that John the Baptist presented Jesus as the Lamb of God in John 1 Verse 29, which we read there. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So, brothers and sisters, Jesus, in his supper, his last Passover, he said to his disciples, would be slain as the Passover lamb that year. This is in verse 28, right? John 18:28. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium, and it was early in the morning. They themselves did not go into the Praetorium, lest they should be defiled, that might eat the Passover. So uh, the Passover had to be examined before it was killed. In Exodus 12, let us read it. Exodus 12, verses 3 to 6. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for household. But if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it to the fourteenth of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation, you see, from the fourteenth, he would be examined, and after examined, he would be to the fourteenth day. The whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. What does that mean? That means that the uh, the priests they had to examine. So Jesus was examined by the, the Passover, uh, it was examined by the high priest and the Roman governor, and no guile was found in him. In the scriptures we see that the lamb had to be examined. Why did they let Jesus to Annas first, the father, Caiaphas' father-in-law? The question that is, can be asked is, if Caiaphas was the high priest, why they let Jesus first to Annas was his father-in-law, right? Caiaphas also prophesied by God that that man would, would, would die for the people. That was a prophecy. Well, Jesus was there as a Passover lamb to die for the people of God. 
My Anas, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, this is important to understand the history, Anas was a high priest, served as a high priest from the 6th year to the, the year 15 after Christ, and he continued with a great influence. He served in the world. Anas was the patri patriarch of a family of high priests. He had a great power, but the Roman officials, for, for someone not to get into much power, the Romans forced the high priest to, to take his priesthood for a period of time and he would have to pass it on to another so that no someone did not have a great influence. But Anas had a great influence together with the Jewish people. He was forced by the Roman Empire to pass on to his children. So five of his children, they exercised this function and now was it the, the time of Caiaphas, his son-in-law, to serve in the role. The Sinas was the patriarch of a family, was the one with the more prestige, who was the patriarch of a family of high priests, and men still considered him to be the legitimate holder of the, of the position, even though the Roman officials considered Caiaphas at the time of Jesus' trial. Just to understand that with history, why Anas had to examine him. Now from verse uh, 15 through 18, we see the record that Peter denies Jesus. This is sorrowful, isn't it? The one who says that he would, even that everybody would let him go, he would nev never abandon him. He ended up denying him. Let us read quickly verse 15. Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple. This is another disciple, but this is most likely to be John. Now that disciple was known to the high priest, went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. That is, Jesus entered in the courtyard of the high priest and John. He was known to the high priest he could also get into the courtyard. But Peter stood at the door outside. He did not have that privilege. Then the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. Probably John was known by the high priest spoke to to the woman who kept the door and brought Peter in. Verse 17, Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of his men's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. I am not. Now the servants and officers who had made a fire of coals stood there, for it was cold, they warmed themselves. Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Let us get to verse, skip to verse 25. Now Simon Peter stood and warmed himself, therefore they said to him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. So there in the courtyard should be a cold moment. Everybody, they were warming themselves. You know that the Roman soldiers were there. Lots of people from the Sanhedrin were there. And Peter was there. They asked and he, he, he said he was not. And then in verse 26, one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him, Look at the destin the fate here. One of relative of him who was here Peter cut off said You cut off my relatives here. 
Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied again. And immediately a rooster crowed. Lord Jesus. Look at the rooster. Lord Jesus. Well, let us continue here. The, the Anas with the interrogation of Jesus. Then we go back to Peter. In verse 19. Then a high priest and asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet in the secret and I have said nothing. Why do you ask me and those who have heard me what I said to them? Indeed, they know what I said. Zenas asked, about his disciples and what he was teaching. Jesus said, what I speak is openly to the world. Nothing to hide. There's nothing hidden. And he said these things. One of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand saying, do you answer the high priest like that? Jesus answered to him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. If I have spoken evil, you bear witness of the evil. But if I, if well, why do you strike me? Then Anas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So when I saw that, there would this kind of interrogation would get to nothing because there is nothing to hide. If Jesus was speaking openly what he was teaching to everyone, and then he sent him to Caiaphas. Poor Jesus. Let us go back to Peter. Saints, do you remember in John chapter 13, Peter reacted in a strong way in John 13, 37, Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Jesus answered him, Will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly say to you, The rooster shall not crow to have denied me three times. You know what does that mean? This was recorded to show you, brothers and sisters, that we do not know our own incapacity because with there in a impetuosity of impulse of a heroism we do not know ourselves because, but before uh, situations that are more intimidating with a 500 Roman soldiers and the the, the Roman guards, at the Sanhedrin at that night, the torches, swords, clubs, lanterns, saints, that situation, you're about to lose your life as well. So at a moment of a great risk of death, you don't know how, how you would react. Do not be arrogant, thinking that you can stomp on your chest and say, I would never do that. So, to deny the Lord three times makes Peter conduct uh, without excuse. So, if you deny the Lord once, that would be maybe a weakness at a point, but three times, so the Lord made sure that he would deny him three times to make very evident that the natural man is not trustworthy. Because but when everything is good, the natural man prom promises everything, but in situations of great pressure, he ended up revealing who we really are. Jeremiah 17, 5. What does it say? What does it say, Jeremiah 17, 
Faz. Assim Senhor, maldito o homem que confia no homem. Faz da carne mortal o seu braço. Cursed is the man who trusts in man. Makes flesh his strength. Was heart departs from the Lord. Do not trust man. Do not trust in another man or in you, you yourself. Because man is not trustworthy. Many times we make we, we make our flesh it's not our arms but it's not trustworthy we make our flesh a strength but it's not trustworthy Luke 22 61 and the Lord turned and looked at Peter then Peter remembered the word of the Lord how he said to him before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. Bitterly. He wept because he realized how he was incapable. He said things that he did not know. He did not know himself. I think at this moment Peter seemed that if I am Jesus, if I were Jesus, I would give up on me because I'm ashamed. It was difficult for Peter. So Jesus is questioned by Pilate. Let us return to John 18, verse 28. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. From this point forward, Jesus is judged by man. At the house of the, the high priest, he was judged by the leading ones of the Jewish leaders, but by the law. Now he's judged by the law of man. So Jesus, before Pilate, he took Jesus to the Praetorium was, was the Antonius Fortress. It was, but they themselves, it was early in the morning, but they themselves did not go to the Praetorium lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. So it was at that night, the twilight, they would eat the Passover. So they, sh they could not be defiled that day. And the law of the Jews, after purification, if they were to enter at the house of the Gentiles, they would be defiled again, they would not be ready to eat the Passover. That they, that they would eat the Passover at that time. That was exactly during the Passover that Jesus was crucified. So they could not then go into the praetorium. In Pilate, he, he could not get in. So they, they were left there in the, the... But Pilate then went out, verse 29, Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? So in today's terms, that would be a robber. This man would not be a robber. He was not an evildoer. Evildoer here is a robber in today's terms. We would not have delivered him up to you. Pilate was a governor of Judea. The, the, the Jewish leaders wanted to kill Jesus. But I don't know if you know, under the Roman Empire, the Jews did not have the right to condemn, to, to kill someone who is condemned. So condemnation, the execution, of death penalty had to be done through the Roman Empire. So the Jews were crazy to kill Jesus. They wanted to see Jesus killed. Jesus was disturbing their project of power. 
So they needed the favor of the human government. Do you understand? They needed to convince the Roman governor that they had to condemn Jesus and to kill Jesus. If the Jews had the right to kill the convict, Jesus would not be killed with crucifixion, and the scripture would not be fulfilled. Jesus would be killed with what? Among the Jews, the death penalty is stoning. Remember the adulterous woman, the brought to Jesus, wanted to stone her. So the condemnation and killing would be through stoning. So Jesus would be, uh, if it were by the, the, the Jews, would be stoned to death. Then, would not be fulfilled the scriptures and the prophecies. So Jesus had to be, Jesus would have had to be sentenced by the Roman Empire to die on the cross. But the Jews were in the hands of the governor. If the governor would to decide to let him go, they would not know what to do. So they were pushing, pushing, pushing to the limit so that Pilate would make a decision to condemn Jesus and to kill Jesus. But the governor said, what is the reason? Why? What accusation do you bring against this man? He, he has no, nothing to be uh, killed. There's no reason for him to be killed. And he said, oh, but if he were not an evildoer, I would not have delivered him up to you. So let it, what, what happened? Let us continue here with, to read to you. In verse 31, and Pilate said to him, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. He had no, no reason to put him to death, that the sin of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. He would have to, to be sentenced by the death penalty of the Romans. And do you know that Crucifixion it is the worst death also among the Romans. It is the most suffering one. Lord Jesus. Maybe in another message we have to, to talk about it, to share about that. You're hanging on your arms and on your foot and your whole body hanged in the strength of your arms the foot holding a while. Imagine hanging there for hours. You have no more strength to hold yourself. When your body leans downward, the diaphragm pushes the lungs. You cannot breathe because you're pushing too hard. So for you to take a breath, you have to use your muscle and to to get up a little bit to take some breath. You cannot do it for a long time and then you get back down. So it, it is a terrible feeling, you have no strength, but you, you need to get up to get some air. But it's terrible, it is of course besides the, besides the, the, the pain in the hands and the feet. So some criminals stay there for one, two days living. Imagine that. That's why the Jews could not let that to get on the Sabbath. So they asked uh, the pilot to break his legs. Because when you break his legs, you lose, uh, you cannot sustain yourself and then you, you die with suffocation. But Jesus, nobody uh, broke the, 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 the legs of Jesus. You can see that in the next message. This, see that to die on the cross, is, it is a terrible, kind of death uh, with the Romans. So, let us continue. Lord Jesus. Pilate then realized their intent because no, no crime committed. Uh, he realized the great pressure of the Jews. If the death of Jesus was by the Jew was made by the Jews would be according to stone. 
but according to the uh, the Old Tes Testament, Jesus would be raised on a tree. Remember, the serpent of bronze was raised. John 3.14, Jesus mentions that 8.29 also. And John 8.32, because he was hanging on a tree. Acts 5.30. Let us read that. Acts chapter 5, verse 30. What does it say? Lord Jesus. Acts 5.30. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. In Acts 10.39. Uh, Galatians, Acts 13, 29, Galatians 3, 13, and 1 Peter 2, 24. Let us read to finish here. 1 Peter, 1 Peter 2, 24. Home himself bore our sins in, our, in his own body on the tree that we have died to sins might live for righteousness. By with stripes you were healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Saints, because he hung on the tree, was crucified, our sins were forgiven, and uh, by with stripes we are healed, and you are like sheep going astray, like Jesus in Matthew 9, found the multitudes, saints, they were all weary and scattered. But saints, now, through his death and resurrection, we are no longer led astray. We're not going astray, we have returned to the shepherd. We have an overseer of our souls. Saints, the part of our being that is most need of shepherding is not just the body, it's not just for food, but food for our soul. Our soul it is the, the part that is lost the most, right? Praise the Lord. Today, because of his suffering of Christ on the cross, today we have a shepherd. We have an overseer of our souls. Very good. Let me let us return to John. Lord Jesus. Verse 33. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again. Called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? So the Jews wanted Pilate to kill Jesus by sedition. He wanted to cause a revolt against the Roman Empire, but that, Jesus did not come for that. And Jesus answered, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? So that is, you're saying this because of pressure of the Jews. You saw, I have no, no reason to be, to be killed. Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation, the chief priests, have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus said, I did nothing. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Father therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause, I was born, and for this cause I have come into this world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Saints, why are we preaching the gospel of the kingdom on the streets? Because Jesus came to be a king. Indeed, 
He came to take the kingdom of this world, not to fight against the Roman Empire. His kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom, brothers and sisters, is the kingdom of heaven. He will rule over this earth. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to him, I find no fault in him at all. I don't know why, why you're pushing me. I see no fault. I find no fault in him. Then he did something ugly. He, he gave, handed him to popular jury. Imagine, he had the power decision. He, he gave that responsibility for the Jewish people. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They all cried again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. He was a robber. Saints, look how ugly this is. Our Lord Jesus was born to be a king, indeed. Not of this world. Why? I read for you many times. Luke 1, right? Luke 1. When the angel Gabriel from God, he was sent from God to Galilee, a city of Galilee called Nazareth. There was a virgin betrothed to Joseph from the house of David, because they both must come from the seed of David, from the tribe of kingship. So kings come out of that tribe, and Jesus is king. He was born to be the king. And, and the, the, the virgin was Mary. And when the angel came in, he said, Rejoice, Lord is with you. And she was troubled. And she was thinking, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you, plus you are among men. When he, and the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. Luke 131, Behold, you will conceive in your womb, and bring forth a son, to call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. His kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom is, well, there will be no end. That is why I also read in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. Let us repeat it here, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, showing why a child is born, why he is given to us, a son is given. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Brothers and sisters, before reading verse 7, let me get your attention to this. He is the Prince of Peace. He is Lord Jesus. He also fulfills righteous. Why did I say that? Judgment and righteousness. You realize that in Jesus' trial, not even the Jewish leaders made righteousness. Not even Pilate's judgment indicating the righteousness of this world made righteousness. So, it's full of failures. Righteousness of man, brothers and sisters, it is prone to bribe and pressure. 
because of the pressure of the Jews, Pilate condemned Jesus. They are subject to that. So we do not feel uh, safe in this world, but praise the Lord. In the manifestation of the kingdom of heaven, you have a thousand years of the kingdom of Jesus. His kingdom, brothers and sisters, this kingdom it is, by the, is ruled by the Prince of Peace. In this kingdom, we will have peace. Because in this kingdom, there will be righteousness. The true righteousness for a thousand years. It is of peace. And after this thousand years, he'll give his kingdom to God. And of course, God will be reigning with righteousness and peace forever. So saints, today we fall short of righteousness. We fall short of peace. So that is why, saints, we are going out to the streets to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Because our hope, it is the coming of the kingdom of God, of Christ, the manifestation of the kingdom of heavens. Today, the church is already living in God's righteousness and peace. Because the church is the reality of the kingdom of heavens. For our hope, it is coming in the manifestation of the kingdom of heavens for a thousand years will be in a kingdom of righteousness and peace. That is why saints, Matthew 24, 14, what does it say? And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. When the gospel of the kingdom is preached in all the world, there will be a time for Christ to take up his kingdom. When Christ takes up his kingdom, he will put an end to all unrighteousness and lack of peace. We'll be living saints in righteousness and peace forever. Jesus is Lord. Amen.